You know, when I heard Chris talk about that last night at our Saturday service, I thought, man, there's, uh, there's going to be a lot of dads in the room this weekend who uh, are thinking about what kind of father they've been. There's going to be a lot of young dads who are thinking about being a dad or who've already had young children that are going to be contemplating what kind of father they have been to their kids. And I just want to start out by saying, uh, before we get into this again, happy Father's Day. And as a father, I, I'd like to file a formal complaint. A, um, a little boy was asked to define Father's Day, and he said, it's just like Mother's Day, only you don't spend as much money. <laughs> it's just not right, man. The greatest number of calls on a single day in the United States was recorded on Mother's Day. The record number of collect calls was recorded on Father's Day. That's just not right, man. There's something going on there. I don't like it. Uh, now, look, the, the, the challenge that I have this weekend is, is really a, a challenge that I have all the time when I deal with a topic like this. On the one side, I want to be very careful not to make anybody feel bad at church. You know, I, I, want, you to be, I want you to leave here encouraged and say, I can do this, man. I got this life. I'm going to take the tiger by the tail, and I'm going to live this life Christ has called me to live. On the other hand, I've got this awesome responsibility that God gave me to constantly give you a preemptive strike, to tell you, do not go down the path that so many others have gone down. The problem is, if I tell you that, there will be people in the audience that have gone down that path, and they'll feel bad. So what do you do? Well, I think that's where you just present the truth of God's Word, let it land, chuck as much seed as you can, and let it land where it will land. But I, I do ask you, if you'd give me if you'd give me some grace. And I've asked you that a lot lately, because as a pastor, I do love you, and I, I have concern for you, but I can't keep going down a road that would not say anything that's going to challenge you. you. We need to be challenged. We're, we're losing our country, our communities, our society, because no one will stand up with courage, even though someone may get angry, and speak the truth of God in love. That's the key, in love. If you know somebody's saying a hard word to you, but it's coming from a, I'm concerned about you and our families and our community, then it's different, isn't it? So can you hear me on this just for a moment? In America, 23.6% of the children, 17.4 million, almost one in four children live in father-absent homes. Children living in female-headed homes with no spouse, that is, no husband or father, have a poverty rate of 47.6%, over four times the rate of children living in married couple families. Four times. The absence of a biological father contributes to increased risk of child maltreatment. There's no father around to protect the, the son, the daughter, from the ills of society and what could happen out there. Notice I'm not quoting right now from the Bible or from Christian magazines. I'm quoting from things like the U.S. Census Bureau or Department of Health and Human Services. Individuals from father-absent homes are 279% more likely to carry guns and deal drugs than peers living with their fathers. Compared to pregnant women without father support, pregnant women with father support experience a lower prevalence of pregnancy loss. Wow, 22.2% versus 48.1%. Children raised in father-absent homes are two times more likely to suffer from obesity. There are 2 million single father households, 10 million single mother households in the United States. Daughters are less likely to engage in risky sexual behavior when they have a consistent contact and a sense of closeness with their dads. Dad's involvement during pregnancy positively influences health outcomes for mom, dad, and baby. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes, 90%. 85% of all children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes, and 80% of rapists with anger issues come from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. So now we know. A child without a father who is present in his or her life. There are ramifications. 
We can stick our head in the sand all we want and say, no, kids are resilient. But now we know, not from the Bible, not from some religious piece of literature, we know just from the U.S. Department of Health, the Center for Disease Control, National Principles Association report, Justice and Behavior, all tell us. And as I look around and I meet, these, I meet a lot of young guys who are fathers but not fathers, and they'll say, yeah, but I had this kid by accident. Okay, okay, but you're still the father. And the thing that's missing in our society and the reason we're self-destructing is the word duty. There's a duty associated with every action and reaction. Down deep in your heart, you know this is true because you applaud people who do their duty and you disdain people who don't. Let me give you two examples. Not too long ago, an Air Canada flight from Dallas to Toronto, fire breaks out in mid-flight in the restroom. The pilot knows he's only got a few moments to sit, descend rapidly if he's going to save the lives of the people on board. He has this dramatic descent at a furious speed. He touches down, surrounded by all these emergency vehicles. As soon as they open the doors, if you read the story, the entire aircraft, sucking in the oxygen, turned into an inferno. There were some fatalities. A lot of people suffered burns. But because of his skill and his duty, many lives were saved. The captain was the last one to get off the plane. He said, I am not leaving till every person that I'm responsible for on this aircraft has left the aircraft. They had to pull him, literally pull him from the plane with his jacket on fire. That's called duty. It causes you to do things like that. To forsake the survival of the fittest and to give your life up for something else because it's your duty and we applaud it. The response was just as overwhelming as we gave Sully when he landed on the Hudson River who received a heartfelt hero's welcome because he did his duty under amazing pressure. Now let me give you the second example. How many of you remember in April 2014 in Seoul, Korea, a ferry capsizes? It had a number of high school students on board. Most of the high school students died. They were simply standing on the ship waiting for the captain to give the abandoned ship command. The only problem was he had already abandoned ship. He got off before everybody else, and all of these high school students died. There was a chorus of condemnation all over the world. And these parents who had entrusted this captain with the lives of their children began to spew anger and vitriol like lava from a volcano. Why? Because he didn't do his sense of duty. The teacher who had organized the trip committed suicide because he didn't think it was right for him to be alive while all these high school students perished. In fact, the prime minister of South Korea offered to resign because of the rippling effect. No celebration, no commendation, just a series of wrong decisions that resulted in the ultimate wrong decision of a man who put himself first and failed to do his duty. Duty is the handmaid of love and honor. It's doing the right thing even when it's inconvenient for you. It's to assume responsibility that comes with any and every action and reaction. And Solomon, the smartest man who ever lived, prayed to God for wisdom. And why did he pray for wisdom? We forget that part. He said, give me wisdom that would cause my large family to flourish. What wisdom could I have so that my family would flourish? And the word of the Lord came. The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. Duty of man it's the fear man and keep his commandments. Duty. It's the thing that's held our society together in the past. It's what inspires a man to protect his country. It's what convinces a man to take his family to church. It's what causes a man to marry a young girl that he's gotten pregnant. It's what catalyzes a person to put themselves in harm's way on behalf of another. It's the thing that inspires a man to work through the difficulties of his marriage for the sake of his children. It's the thing that would ignite a man to work hard and put a roof over his children's heads and food on their table. Duty, responsibility to the people God has given you. The reason a German flag does not fly over these United States is because men and women saw it as their duty to sacrifice their lives so that you could have the freedom to sit here and talk about this. 
You want to see a picture of duty? Let me show you some photos of duty. This is what duty looks like. This is what it means to do your duty. Duty is giving yourself up for something that is greater. It's the thing that keeps a family together, that keeps a father with his wife, a wife with her husband. Duty is the thing that holds a community together. And when a sense of duty is lost, autonomy reigns and families, communities, and society self-destruct. Here's the irony of this. The reason that this sense of duty is dissipating in America is because those who lived before us had such a strong sense of duty that they gave their lives for us so that you and I could live in an affluent world with freedoms. The problem is that what they gave to us, we've now become addicted to. We're so addicted to affluence and convenience that when a pastor comes along and mentions the word duty, we protest out of fear that what he's going to say may handcuff us in some way from doing what we really want to do. But that's what duty is. It's doing what you're responsible to do, even though it might be inconvenient for you to do it. Now we know. We, we don't have to guess anymore. We know statistically that the Bible has been true for hundreds, if not thousands of years, that a fatherless child suffers. And we know it. So my first piece of advice to all dads, number one, do your duty, man. You're a father. Act like one. Do what is right rather than what is convenient. Duty recognizes a call greater than yourself. Do what's honorable. Do what is sacrificial. It's not about you. It's about your family. It's about your sons and your daughters. Sacrifice personal accolades for the sake of presence and nurture. Sacrifice image for the sake of substance. Sacrifice temporal gain for the sake of eternally defined profit. And sacrifice standing in the boardroom for the sake of standing by the crib. You can do it. I believe in you. I do. Man up. Cowboy up. Pull your shorts up. You got this. You can do it. It's your duty. And it begins with providing for your family. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I didn't think there was anything worse than an unbeliever. Evidently there is. And this word provide in the original language in which the Bible is written is an exhaustive term. The greatest provision a father can give the family is not monetary. You don't pay off your kids by giving them everything that they want. That's not what they ultimately want. And the Bible goes to great lengths to warn parents, be careful of giving your children everything they ask for. It's okay to say no to every new iPhone. But also, the Bible wants you actually to understand why. Gary Thomas, listen carefully, Gary Thomas in his book, Authentic Faith, talks about the time he took his little children to Knott's Berry Farm. And it happened to be on one of those days. Have you ever been to Disneyland when nobody's hardly there, so you just keep riding your favorite rides again and again and again and again and again? I've been to Disneyland, and my favorite ride is Soaring Over California. And I was there one day when it was a little rainy, and I just went around. So he talks about in his book that the kids were having the time of their lives, and they stayed on their favorite rides and rode them again and again and again. And he says, then his six-year-old daughter, Kelsey, having the time of her life, and then he says, but after about three hours, however, I noticed something curious. She jumped off some little cars. Earlier, she had ridden a train, a log ride, a Ferris wheel, a flying school bus, you name it. So she jumps off this little car. Her words, however, revealed a spirit that was getting more hungry, not less. What's next? she asked with a slightly desperate edge to her voice. And that's when he says, I realize there's never enough stuff to quieten the human heart. I've been doing this for a long time now. Dads, the reason your children continue to ask for everything is twofold. Number one, because you keep saying yes. And number two, because they're not getting what they really want. See, they're like you. And when you're Needs are unmet and there's something missing. Marketers know that. 
So they tell you things like you're worth it, and if you have this, your life will be fulfilled. This is the thing that's missing, and you keep believing and buying and buying and buying and buying, but you know it's an insatiable lust. It never fills. It never gives what it promises. When your children are not getting what they really want, they'll, they're smart. They'll go after your jugular. <laughs> they'll even make you think if you keep giving them everything they want, iPhones, iPads, whatever, that they'll love you more. That's not ultimately what they want. And down deep inside, you know it. Listen, I cannot remember most of the birthday or Christmas presents my parents got me. Now, I do remember a few like the Rock'em Sock'em robots that I share almost every Christmas. But I can't remember most of the presents my mom and dad got me. And I can't, I can't remember being angry at my parents for something they didn't get me. Now, I'm sure that I was, but I got over it pretty quickly. Evidently, it wasn't life or death like I thought it was at the time. But can I tell you what I do remember? I do remember my dad working 60-hour weeks and driving his car as fast as he could to get to my Little League baseball game. I do remember my dad taking a Saturday off so that he could drive to Cincinnati, Ohio, six hours away, and stay in the, spend the night in a hotel when my mom and dad didn't have that kind of money to make sure that they could witness their son's national basketball tournament. I remember my dad driving as fast as he could to stand down on the north end of the basketball court to make sure he didn't miss my high school basketball games. I can remember my father driving as fast as he could after work to get there to the awards banquet. I can remember my dad putting his arm around me and said, Seth's okay, son, you'll get him next year. I can remember my dad always being present at major events in my life. That's what I remember. But you know something that I remember even more? This is going to surprise you because it surprised me. Trips behind the woodshed. Why do I remember those and I don't remember all the presents? I, I'm serious about this now. I started thinking about this. Why do I remember that? Why do I remember the speech that my dad gave me after I had spoken disrespectfully to my mom? Why do I remember my dad calling me behind the woodshed when my older brother had thrown a baseball bat at my younger brother and he was calling me as a witness? <laughs> Why do I remember those things? Why do I remember my dad, hey, you guys who lived in the generation when we got this more right? Do you remember when your dad would unbuckle his belt? And <laughs> do you remember the sound that it would make as it hit every socket? It was a sound that would cause your heart to shudder, right? And then I don't know what your dad did, but behind the woodshed, he said, now assume the position. You know what that meant, right? You put your hands, your hands on your toes, and he takes out the, the, the board of education applied to the seat of knowledge, and he'd take that, Bam! Bam! Why do I remember that? And why do I not hate my dad for it? Why do I not hate my dad? Think about it. Why do I not hate my dad for that? Let me tell you what happened. When I came out from behind the woodshed, here was the feeling in my heart. One, I had a feeling down here I didn't like. <laughs> but I had this other feeling, and the other feeling was this. My dad's the boss, and he's in charge, and he will protect our family. Something happened where I, my dad is the man. And he's going to punish me when I do the wrong thing. And he warned me, he told me, don't do that. And if you do it, you're going to face the... And that gave me a sense of, okay, I got it. I live in this world and in this house, and I get to eat this food and go to school. My dad takes care of me, but my dad is the law, and what he says goes, okay, I got it now. I'm clear on this. Do you know... I remember on a Saturday mornings when my dad would come and say, hey, Jeff, let's go fishing. Now, why would I want to go fishing with the guy who smacked me with a board paddle? <laughs> and we never caught any fish. But it didn't matter. I was just with dad. Do you know how many children will never experience any of these things I just talked about? And as a result, will never have that internal satisfaction and knowledge of knowing their dad is there to protect them, to love them. Yes, there's going to be cause and effect, but dad is there and he's large and in charge. Folks, the Huffington Post, do you know the Huffington Post? It's so far left, it's almost right again. <laughs> it's probably the most liberal publication in America. It's discovered some things that it printed in an article. It thinks it's new. It's been around for thousands of years in the Bible, but it thinks it's discovered something new. So an article comes out that says 15 things your daughter wants from dad. Number one, she wants to be loved more than she wants stuff 
that you can buy for her and things you can teach her. She wants you to love her, the Huffington Post says. And then the Post goes so far as to say this, no one else on earth can assume your role as daddy. No substitutes, just you. Your daughter will let you down, make huge mistakes, and maybe even turn her back on you for a season, but don't ever let her doubt your love for her. Look in her eyes and tell her you love her lots. From the Huffington Post, man. (laughs) It goes on to say, by the way, the kind of man you are to her will have a direct impact on who she marries someday, and if you're doing it right, she'll marry somebody like you. In the Huffington Post. Listen to what it also says. It says, proximity does not equal presence. And then the author opens up a little bit. I'm guilty of forgetting this often. The simple fact that you're there doesn't mean you're really there, especially in an era of constant information and entertainment. Turn your phone off when you get home from work or at least put it in another room. Your daughter couldn't care less about your Twitter feed, your emails, your fantasy football team, or your group texts. She cares about spending time with you, playing with you, being with you. In the Huffington Post, (laughs) it's been in the Bible for thousands of years. So first, men, for the sake of your daughter and your son, do your duty. You're a father. Act like one. Do what's right rather than what is convenient. Recognize there's a call greater than yourself. Do what is honorable and sacrificial. It's not about you anymore. It's about your wife and your daughter and your son and your family. But it doesn't stop there. Solomon, the smartest man who ever lived, asked God for wisdom that his people may flourish. And God says the whole duty of man is to fear God and to keep his commandments. Fear God. Now, listen. Mary Eberstadt, who is a sociologist, wrote a work called How the West Really Lost God. Did you hear that? How the West Really Lost God. We're the West. And she says the fortunes of religion rise and fall with the state of the family. And then she says it has long been recognized that experience with an earthly father deeply informs the perspective about the heavenly father. So here I have a sociologist telling me what the Bible has told me for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. That's a lot of pressure, isn't it, guys? Do you hear what I just said? That means the way our daughter or or, or, uh, uh, son looks at us is the way ultimately they're going to look at at their, their heavenly father. To them, their heavenly father is a glorified version of the earthly father, just more intense. Now, what does that mean? It means pressure, man. You think we men don't feel pressure? Our example is God. That's pressure. We had a basketball player in college who was an All-American in practice. I mean, he could do everything. But as soon as he got in the game, he panicked. Pressure was too much. And he had that look in his eyes. You know, guys who are athletes, you know, they're looking at, don't throw me the ball. I'm terrified. (laughs) And so you, okay, go the other way. But between his junior and senior year, I took him to basketball camp with me, and I said, Glenn, man, you've got to stand. you got one more year. We need you to play in games like you do in practice because we didn't get any great recruits this coming year. We need you. If we're going to go back to the national tournament, you got to step up, man. And I don't know what happened. Maybe he went home and thought about it, talked to his dad or whatever. He was a totally different player. He played so well, we went back to the national tournament, primarily due to him. Listen, there's a lot of pressure when you get in the fatherhood game. But you can do it. You can. Jesus will give you suck it up power. (laughs) He will. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Stephon Curry has that written on his basketball shoes, which caused him to lose a contract with Nike, but that's okay. Under Armour picked it up. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens. Fatherhood's not easy, but it shapes a nation. Now stay with me. The English Standard Version of this popular verse goes like this. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Now what's this really about? Well, It's not as though God sits up in heaven and says, man, Pastor Jeff, if you make that mistake as a father, I'm going to make sure I visit your sins upon the generation, the generation. That's not what it's saying. The Bible is saying that God has created us and there's a cause and effect associated with the universe. 
that even though God is merciful, remember the first part of the verse, God, is merc- God forgives man and separates your sins as far as the east is from the west, but the mistakes that you make, the sins you commit are visited, visited in the sense that there's a pattern that starts developing, a cycle that goes from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. And the Bible says God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. God doesn't take the ramifications away from decisions that you make. He does forgive you, and he's merciful, and he's just, but you live in a world where there's cause and effect, where cycles begin. And I remember my father praying around the communion table at church on the weekends. My father came from a father who beat him with a shovel because he had a stutter. And every time my dad stuttered, his father would beat him. My father's father was a gambling, alcoholic mess. He had the father from hell. And yet I would see him get up at church on the weekend and stand at the end of the communion table And when I was younger, I would say, don't pray, Dad, don't pray, because he would embarrass me. That's what you do when you're young. But as I got older, my thoughts changed to, dude, my dad must love God. Evidently to my dad, it was more important to pray and acknowledge his father to his children than it was to be embarrassed by people. The Huffington Post, man. (laughs) Teach her that it's not about her. Something amazing happens when we realize that the universe doesn't spin around us. We're not modeling it perfectly for our girls, but we're trying to show them that life is best lived when we give ourselves away to serve others to go last. (laughs) From the Huffington Post, man. I remember my father, I've told this story numerous times with the envelope on the mantle, God's money, and it was the tithe. We didn't have a lot, man. I had three brothers, and we had two bedrooms, one for my mom and dad and one for me and my three brothers, double bunk beds. We didn't have a lot. We did our own garden out in the Tennessee summer and hot and humid, but we were growing green beans and digging potatoes and shucking corn, all the stuff you hate to do when you're young. But we did it to survive. But every Sunday when we went to church, dad grabbed that envelope, and he did that so his Sons would know that every good thing comes from God and the first fruits of all that we have go to Him no matter how big or small. The Huffington Post. Teach her. It's not about her. Something amazing happens when we realize that the universe doesn't spin around us. We're not modeling it perfectly for our girls, but we're trying to show them that life is best lived when we give ourselves away to serve others, to go last. Not to tell them it's all about them, but to tell them it's all about them giving themselves away to help someone else. And what about those times behind the woodshed with dad? I'm still amazed at how I felt and how I feel today. Do you know, in Ephesians, we're told, fathers, so that's a direct line to you, dad, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Don't have time to dissect every word here, but I will tell you there's a relationship an inseparable relationship between discipline and instruction in the original language, what the Bible is communicating is that the way a father provokes his children to anger is by refusing to be consistent in his disciplinary actions. In other words, if I do something wrong and my dad has told me, if you do that, here's the result, and the results happen the first time, but the second time I do it and my dad ignores it, that's inconsistency, and somehow that frustrates the child because he doesn't know, okay, what is really right or wrong here? You don't seem to be able to make up your mind, and the only time you punish me is when you get angry. So the Bible says, fathers, it's important that you're consistent that your children know these are the the laws, these are the lines. And as you raise a kid like that, when he or she gets older, they also respond like that to authority in their lives. Some of you are saying, yeah, now, Pastor Jeff, I see the problem. My father was horrible at all these. He was absent, apathetic, aggressive, and an arrogant narcissist. But here's why we're doing this service this weekend. The problem is you're going to become just like him in your anger. Counselors have been saying for generations, beaten children beat their wives. Cheating husbands raise cheating sons. Absent fathers beget absent fathers. What sense does that make that a child that hated so much how his father treated him would repeat it? 
And the reason is Mary Eberstadt, let me go back to that quote, the fortunes of religions rise and fall with the state of the family. It has long been recognized that experience with an earthly father deeply informs the perspective about the heavenly father. So when a father on earth fails his duty, the son or daughter sees God as a failure in that area as well. My dad was absent. God must be absent. My dad was apathetic. God must be apathetic. My dad was abusive. God must be abusive. Dad did not care. God doesn't care. And then they are so filled with anger that they end up repeating the father's failure. But the first part of that verse says, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, which means that the cycle can be stopped. For the sake of your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, you can stop it right now, and it would impact generation after generation after generation. There's nothing you can do about the past, but you can say, I'm not going to repeat that. I'm going forward. Look, I am the product. I am the product of two parents who had a horrible fathers. My dad's dad beat him with a shovel. My mother's dad screamed and yelled because he would lose money at the track or wherever, gambling, then get drunk and then come home and beat the family. And yet my mom and dad decided when they had this relationship with Jesus Christ that they were going to stop the cycle. No more. And both of them had to work really hard at it. Let me give you an example. On one of those trips behind the woodshed when my dad took his belt off and da-da-da-da-da, you know, <laughs> bend over, assume the position. On the third hit, I always got three whacks. Bam, bam. And by the way, I'm okay. Do I not look okay? <laughs> so my dad, my dad on the third whack, and it was just, I mean, come on, man. I mean, it's, it's, come on. It hurt, but it didn't hurt. You know, it hurt, but it didn't hurt. On the third whack, though, the belt slipped out of his hand, and the belt buckle came around, hit me in the head, and knocked me out. <laughs> when I came to, when I came to, my dad was kneeling down beside me. I'd never seen my dad cry before because it brought back, it brought back memories. And you know, my dad never used the belt on me again. Of course, I was 28 years old, so. <laughs> no, no, no. I was young. I was young. But I think it really jarred my dad. But I was still disciplined, believe me. And now I'm about to be a grandfather. You know, I, I never really knew, I never knew what the big deal was. Oh, I know what it is now. I, know, I get it. And Ada Claire is going to be born into the Vines family on July 16th or somewhere thereabout. And she is going to be the third generation of the Vines family who have experienced a present father because my dad stopped the cycle I had a present father my son Delaney has had a present father and now Ada Claire will have a present father and my question to you is if the sins of the father are passed on to the generations how much more than the grace and the mercy and love passed on to the fourth generation which tells me that since my dad stopped the cycle and loved his sons, and his son, and there are four of us, all of us love our children, Ada Claire will be that fourth generation, which means she will have the capacity to change the world. She will have all the culmination of the love of God, the faithfulness of parents, all wrapped up into one little life. So can I ask you fathers to consider four things to do as you leave here. And they go quickly. Number one, when Jesus was baptized, there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. This is my beloved son. Look to your son and say, you are my son. I love you and I'm proud of you. If you will say those three things to your son or your daughter, starting now, even if they're older, just start now. It will forgive a multitude of sin. You are my son. Now, if it's a daughter, don't say you are my son. <laughs> you are my son. You are my daughter. I love you. I'm proud of you. Two, be present at crucial events. 
the Huffington Postman. <laughs> Show up to her events. As dads of young daughters, most of us are building careers at the same time. So it's not possible every single time, but make the effort to get to her stuff, even if it's not your favorite stuff. I hate the commercial of the dad at the daughter's dance recital who is watching a football game on his phone. I love a good football game as much as the next guy, but clap as hard for your daughter's recital as you would on your couch watching sports. I love you. You are my son. I'm proud of you. Be present at crucial events. Third, love their mother. The best thing a man can do for his children is to love their mother. I know you think John Wooden said that, but it was actually Theodore Hesburgh. The Huffington Post, man. <laughs> She's watching how you treat her mom. If you take one thing out of this entire list, make it this. One of the best things you can do for your daughter is to love her mom well. It's easy to be child-centered, running from one kid activity to another, but fight for your marriage. Make it a priority. The seasons of life, when I lose focus on dating Brooke, that's the author's wife's name, are also the same seasons when our children have more issues. I don't think that's coincidental. Love your wife, make time to date her, take her on trips, and show your kids that she's a bigger priority than they are. Folks, that's Ephesians chapter 5. <laughs> and the Huffington Post, they think they came up with it. <laughs> and four, finally, lead your family toward God. Now let me end this, but I need your undivided attention, dads. No matter how good a dad you think you are, I need you to hear me on this, okay? Nothing my dad ever said. No speech behind the woodshed ever did to me. The same thing that happened when I walked into my father's bedroom and I saw him on his knees with his Bible praying. You say, well, I take my kids to church. Ah, no. When's, have your kids ever seen you in that humble position praying? Well, I take them to church. Isn't that? No, 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 it's not. No, it's not good enough. Anybody can do that. But only a person with a personal relationship gets down on his knees in his bedroom and cries out to God. Your kids ever seen you pray? Dads? Have they ever seen you having devotions? Reading your Bible for the sake of reading your Bible? You don't think that matters to them? You know, I didn't know my dad had a devotional life until I saw that. But evidently, I learned a lot more after that. Because my mom would sit on the couch with her Charles Stanley In Touch magazine and her Bible doing her devotions, and everybody knew don't mess with mom during that time. What I didn't know that I learned later is dad would come in in the evenings after work and he'd say, mom, he always called my, my mom, mom. He said, mom, what time's dinner ready? He said, oh, about 45 minutes. He goes, okay, I'm going down to the river. And I would think, what can dad catch possibly in 45 minutes? We live two blocks from Otago River. He wasn't fishing. He's walking by the river talking to God. Do your kids know that there's a time that you have alone time with God? And when faced with a choice to honor God, now this is the big one, when faced with the choice to honor God or other pleasures or pursuits, do your children, do, first of all, do you know your children are watching very closely? This example is going to be painful, but I, it needs to be said. We are told that the next generation of young people they go to church with their parents, but then they leave church as soon as they get old enough. And we're being told the reason is because there's a lack of spiritual authenticity among their parents. And that's defined by this. Many youth have had no or very limited exposure to adult role models who know what they believe, why they believe it, and are committed to consistently living it out. Okay, you understand where we are so far? Okay, I know what mom and dad say, and I know what they say they do, but when it comes right down to it and the choice has to be made, the ultimate pursuit is not God. Now, let me give you an example. Between my junior and senior year, I walked into my father's bedroom one night, and I said, hey, Dad, i got to tell you something. He said, what's that? He goes, well, my basketball coach has decided that we're going to start practicing on Sunday mornings. My dad just kind of went, okay. And I'm thinking, I'm getting out of church. 
He said, okay, I'll take you to uh, practice on Monday. Uh, I'll talk to your coach. What are you going to say? Well, that's, my, that's my problem, not yours. You just do what your coach tells you. I said, okay, Dad. Well, I thought he was going to go see coach by himself. When he got there, he came and got me. He said, let's go talk to your coach. I said, Dad, I don't want to know. Come on, come on. Dad was never disrespectful to anyone. He wasn't. I never remember my dad being disrespectful to anyone. Okay, hold on. Hold on. I just, something popped in my head. Okay, one time. That's another story for another time. Uh, it, it was a guy beating his wife across the street, and my dad wanted to beat the, out of him, so that's another story. <laughs> so my dad grabs me, takes me into the coach's office, and he says, uh, and I, remember, I'm the captain of the basketball team, so it's not like I'm a scrub or somebody that doesn't get any playing time, captain of the basketball team. So dad brings me in and uh, says, Coach, uh, I hear you're, you're going to start practicing on Sundays. And coach says, yeah, we're going to do some Sunday practice. And uh, he says, I think we've got a good chance to, to go state this year. We need a little extra time. And my dad said, well, what time? He goes, well, I really haven't thought much about that yet. And dad, my dad said, let me help you. <laughs> you know, and very respectfully, let me help you. And he said, my son will be at practice at the gym. He will do whatever you as the coach and authority tells him to do, except between the hours of 7.30 and 1.30 on Sunday mornings. Because there's something more important than all of this. And the coach said, oh, okay. I don't know if it had made any difference that I hadn't been the captain or key player, but coach decided practice would be at 1.30 on Sunday afternoons. And my dad, before we went, said, now I will tell you that sometimes revival hits our little church. People start getting saved in their baptism, so I just want you to know we're not leaving early to make it to practice. When we're done, that's when he'll be there. Okay? And then, Coach was so impressed with my dad that he bought our, okay, not, he bought the starting five basketball players to our church the following weekend just to say, what kind of guy, you know? And they came for a while. They didn't, it's, not, it's not a fairy tale story. They didn't, they didn't continue to come, but from time to time they would come back just to hang out with Jeff. I never got punished for that. My coach respected my father and me. Can I say something to you that's going to be hard to hear? Sunday morning sports occurred in America because Christians showed up. Because you, you negotiated if the Christians who call themselves Christians would have said day one no, there would have been enough players that couldn't have had practice on Sunday mornings. Now, some of you would look at that and say to my dad, here's what you'd say, man, that's legalism. You know what my dad would say to you if you said that? My dad would say, legalism? L legalism? No, it's called love for God. Do you think I go to church because I'm afraid God's going to get me? That's not why I go. I go to church because I love God, I love his people, and I, that's where I want to be. I honor God with five hours of my week. Let me tell you something. I was watching my dad very carefully. Very carefully. And I can tell you, you do what you want to with it, but if I would have seen my dad give in at that point, then I would have known, hey, there are some things more important than church and being around God's people and setting aside a day and keeping it holy. And when I got older, I probably would have said, you know, man, I would have rationalized, man, there's a lot more things more important than church I never knew. Movies, day, you know what I'm saying? Your kids are watching. Do your duty. Fear God. Keep his commandments. You say, what's that? Well, I don't have time to deal with it, so you have to come back next week because we're doing the Sermon on the Mount, which are the commandments of God. If you really want to know, Dad, you've got to come back next week. When my dad died, uh, I got the advantage, uh, thanks to Pastor Dane, encouraging me not to make the mistake of waiting too late. I went and talked to my dad. And near the end of his life, my dad said to me a lot of things, and, I've, and you remember things like that, but, I, but dad said to me, son, I'm, I'm really sorry. He said, I never expected to live this long. Now, my dad died at 73, so he didn't live that long, but what he was saying is, I, didn't, I never expected to outlive your mother. And none of us really expected him to either. He was always in bad shape, basically from the abuse he got from his father, but my mom suddenly died of a cardiac myopathy when she was 61. She was a perfect picture of health. So dad lived on. And he said, son, I never intended to live this long. And I got to tell you, I, I saved as much money as I could to give to you kids, but I've gone through so much of it because of my medical condition and my COPD, and it, 
I've just about exhausted so much of it. <laughs> I looked at dad and I said, dad, come on, man. You taught us God will always provide. Look at your sons. We're all doing fine. God will take care of us. And he said, I know, son. But it was my duty. We have a duty that God gave us. Fear God. Keep his commandments. And if you do that, your children will have this awesome sense of stability and authority. And if you teach them it's not all about them, they will have a servant's heart. And can I say this to you? The more you have, the greater the risk. The more you have, the greater the risk. Because you have greater liberty to do things that other people can't do because of a lack of resources. So the more you have, the more those things will get in the way. Dads, do your duty. Father, I thank you and I praise you for your goodness and that you are our Father. I pray that uh, maybe we would have had one of those days when our eyes are opened. That we start to really ask the question of what kind of dads we are. And what it is that we're truly given our children. I pray that we would remember that this great country of ours that has such a heritage in the law of God, in the goodness of God. I pray that we would remember what has built our families, our society, our communities, and our nation and return to you, O oh God. I pray that we fathers would begin, would know that it begins with us, men. It begins with us doing our duty, fulfilling our responsibilities that you've given to us to lead our families and to lead them well. We pray for forgiveness and grace that we know comes in our failures, but we also pray for spiritual strength, for suck it up kind of power to do what will make all the difference in the world in Christ's name. Amen.